The time is July 1776. The place, the Second Continental Congress. The man, Thomas Jefferson. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, passed by the Second Continental Congress, initiated the liberty we now fight to preserve. Our subject today, the foundations of freedom. Insight, the religious principles underlying American democracy, the fundamental connection between faith and freedom. How do you do? My name's Father Kaiser. Thomas Jefferson lived through the second most perilous period in the history of the American people. In his day, as in ours, the liberty of free men was under attack. And yet the Founding Fathers had one great advantage. They had a philosophy of freedom. They knew what they believed and why. They knew where their freedom came from, what its purpose was. In this time of national crisis, and the liberty of free men all over the world is under attack. Let us pause for a moment to explore the minds and the times of the Founding Fathers. In the early summer of 1776, representatives of the 13 English-speaking colonies in North America gathered in Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. Most of the great names in the colonies were present. John and Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Morris, Charles Carroll, Thomas Jefferson, John Hancock, Benjamin Harrison, 56 men in all. The weather was hot, the air humid. The delegates sweltered as they pondered the great decision. They have always considered themselves loyal subjects of the British crown. But recent actions by King George and his parliament have caused them to reconsider their loyalties. More than anything else, they wanted to be free men and it was becoming increasingly clear that they could no longer secure their freedom within the British Empire. It all started 11 years before when the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act. This law placed a tax on all pamphlets, newspapers and advertisements sold in the colonies. In 1767, additional taxes were levied on glass, paint, lead, paper and tea. A howl of protest went up in the colonies. They didn't mind paying taxes, but they refused to pay taxes levied by a parliament 5,000 miles away, a parliament in which they had no voice. From Georgia to Massachusetts, from Carolina to New Hampshire, the cry went up, taxation without representation is tyranny. The British sensed the rest of spirit of the colonies and sent in troops to enforce the laws. But that only served to further annoy the Americans. The red-coated soldiers were taunted in the streets with cries of lobster and bloody back. On March 5, 1770, the inevitable clash occurred. The soldiers fired into a group of Americans killing four men and injuring several more. The Boston Massacre was the unhappy result. The tension increased. In Philadelphia and New York, the colonists refused docking space to British ships carrying taxable tea. 
In Boston, however, the British authorities insisted and the ships entered the harbor. But at night, dressed as Indians, the colonists boarded the ships and they promptly threw the tea into the bay. This was open defiance and the British retaliated. Parliament closed the port of Boston. It forbade town meetings and increased the number of troops quartered in Massachusetts. The colonists were infuriated. They called these acts intolerable and they closed ranks behind their leaders. On September 5, 1774, representatives from all the colonies met in Philadelphia. This was the first Continental Congress. They professed their loyalty to the king, but they demanded the repeal of the Stamp Act. They declared the intolerable acts void, and they prohibited all trade with Great Britain. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! Resistance to the British stiffened. The colonists were determined not to surrender their rights. In Massachusetts, they began to arm themselves for the clash they knew was coming. Organized into bands, they could fight on a minute's notice. Supplies and powder were put in secret hiding places. It remained for General Gage, the British commander in Boston, to ignite the tinder. He sent a thousand of his troops to seize a store of American gunpowder at Concord, a town about 20 miles from Boston. Paul Revere and William Dawes roused the countryside. At Lexington and Concord, the Minutemen met the British and drove them back to Boston. The Revolutionary War had begun. And now, quickly, the Continental Congress, led by Jefferson, reconvened. Crisis hung over the colonies. Drastic action was needed. A decision had to be made. The delegates debated the issue and made their decision. They ordered Thomas Jefferson to draw up the Declaration of Independence. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name of and by the authority of the good people of the colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This is what we believe, and this is why we have acted as we have. We are a free people. We intend to make our own laws, order our own lives, and worship God without governmental interference. For many years, we thought we could be free men within the British Empire. But now we see this is impossible. Our love for freedom is stronger than our loyalty to the British Crown. And this is why we have decided to sever that loyalty and establish a new nation, the United States of America. believe that man is a creature of God. He has been given by God a destiny which is both spiritual and eternal. In order to enable man to achieve this destiny, God has endowed man with rights. No king or parliament can deny these rights because they were not given by a king or parliament they were given by God. And that is why they are unalienable. When a government interferes with the exercise of man's freedom, men have the further right to overthrow that government and establish one of their own choosing. 
this we have decided to do. With the Declaration of Independence, the United States was born. This country was built by a band of revolutionaries who loved freedom more than life itself. Its history has reflected its founding. Our tradition is a tradition of freedom. It is rather for us, the living, to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God might have a new birth of freedom. That government of the people and by the people and for the people may not perish from this earth. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain these rights or keep them. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of religious worship, freedom from want through economic understanding, Freedom from fear through worldwide reduction of armaments. The same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man cannot come from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Our tradition is indeed a tradition of freedom. The torch of liberty ignited by Jefferson, Franklin, and Washington has been passed from one generation of American hands to another and now rests in our own. This torch lights our steps. It illumines our lives. Its possession can give us great fulfillment but its possession also entails grave responsibilities. For like the Founding Fathers, we have been charged by God with the defense of freedom and with its spread to the far corners of the earth. But before we can do this, before we can use, defend, or spread liberty, we must understand it. What is freedom? Who gave man this mysterious power? And why? Why has man been made free? What are these unalienable rights of which Jefferson speaks? More than missiles and bombers and nuclear submarines, America today needs a philosophy of freedom. And once again, to have a clearly articulated explanation of what we as a nation believe and why. Jefferson and the other founding fathers had such a philosophy. Their notion of human freedom and of the nature and destiny of man was derived from the Judaic Christian tradition. It was based on Moses' account of creation in the book of Genesis. The Lord God formed man of the slime of the earth and breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And he gave man dominion over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and the beasts, and the whole earth, and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image, to the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. The Founding Fathers believed in freedom because they believed in the dignity of man. And they believed in the dignity of man because they believed in God who made man in his own image and likeness. But what does it mean to be made in God's image? What does man have in common with God? Certainly it's not man's body that makes him like God. Because God doesn't have a body. He's a pure spirit. It can only be man's soul that makes him like God. That soul is spiritual. It is a mirror in which the face of God is reflected. It is the source of man's rights. It gives man his dignity. The soul makes man different from the other animals. Superior to them, vastly superior. And it enables man to do things that no animal can do. A horse has four legs, but it doesn't know it. Yet all men know that two plus two equals four. 
Most high school students of geometry know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Some physicists understand Einstein's formula, e equals mc squared. Such knowledge takes intelligence. You have it. Animals don't. Your mind enables you to talk with other people, and it gives you a sense of humor. Dogs tell jokes only in cartoons. With your mind, you can make things. Some men build small, other men build big. A dog can ride in a Sputnik, but only a man can make a Sputnik and guide it into orbit. You can decide what you will live for, who you will love and why. Free choice is a human act. I've never seen a cow tortured by indecision. You can worship. You can enter into contact with God and express your relationship to him. This is the highest act of the human personality. To count, to know, to speak and laugh, to make and decide in worship, these are spiritual acts. They are produced by man's soul. We can be certain the soul exists because of what we see the soul doing. We can be sure the soul is spiritual because its acts are spiritual. Jefferson spoke as he did and Washington fought as he did to protect the dignity of the soul and to guard its freedom of action. Now the soul has two great spiritual powers. The first is intellect. At its best, the intellect functions like a camera. It can take the outside world within itself. It absorbs reality. When it has attained this perfection, it possesses the truth, for truth is the identification of mind with reality. Your mind gives you a value far surpassing that of the entire material universe. You can know the, the world, but the world can't know you. You can look through a telescope, but a telescope can't look back at you. You have a power and a dignity which the world lacks. With your mind, you can generalize and manufacture great and lofty concepts as Jefferson and Franklin did. For instance, from your experience of good books, good meals, and good people, you are able to think of goodness in itself. I mean of that which is good without limit. And once you think of pure goodness, you will, of course, desire it. You will love it. And by doing so, you will be using the second of your spiritual power, your will. If you are brought face to face with such a good, you would find it so attractive that you couldn't turn away from it. But for better or for worse, you are not confronted with such a total good. You are confronted with partial goods, with pleasures, persons, things. These things are good. They can satisfy one or another of your desires. But they can perfectly satisfy you. Let's face it. You can take them or you leave them. And this is why you are free. Suppose, for example, you decide to go on a diet. On your way home from work, you decide not to eat potatoes for a month. But what do you find when you get home? Your wife has prepared potatoes for dinner with your favorite gravy. Well, you face a choice. Oh, they sure do look good. And the gravy. Hmm, what a delicious aroma. God wouldn't want me to waste it. Must take care of my health. I have been working pretty hard, and I wouldn't want to hurt my wife. After all, she did go to a great deal of trouble to prepare them. If you look at the potatoes in that way, you will eat them. But there is another way of looking at them. If I eat them, I'll become very fat, and I may even blow up like a balloon. If I had a heart attack and died, well, then who would care for my wife and children? And besides, I am a man of my word. I did make up my mind, and after all, a resolution is a resolution. If you look at the potatoes in that way, you won't eat them. But who decides how you look at them? You do. You control your own thoughts. You determine your own point of view. And that is why you control your actions. That is why you are free. You are, of course, influenced by many things. By your parents, by heredity, by your education, by your economic circumstances. You are influenced by all these things. But you are determined by none of them. You are determined by only one thing. And that's your own free will. Washington and Jefferson and Roosevelt acted as they did. Not because they belonged to a particular political party or because they sprang from particular e economic circumstances, but because they were convinced to the rightness of their actions. Your actions are your own, because they flow from your own free will. They issue from your personality. And this is why you are responsible for them. Freedom makes you the captain of your own destiny, the master of your own acts. It makes you a king in your own domain. Freedom gives you the power to govern. Freedom is, first of all, the power to govern your own body with its emotions and passions. This is no easy job. It 
takes struggle and self-restraint. But it can be accomplished, and it must be accomplished, because you are not fully free until you have learned to discipline yourself. Once you've learned to control your own body, then you can proceed to the government of the material world around you. For freedom is the capacity to dominate your surroundings. The God who has endowed us with unalienable rights has made us Lord of all creation. He has given us charge of the material world. But we must use this power and assert this authority. We can do this by organizing the material world in such a way that it becomes our servant. We do this by humanizing matter by taking the image of God which we find within ourselves and stamping it upon the material universe. This is the significance, the first function of work. Freedom then is many things. It is the power to assume responsibility. It is the power to govern one's body in the material world. But it's more than this. Considered most fundamentally, freedom is the power to love. It is the power to give oneself to another, the power to dedicate one's life to the service of God. To each individual, God says, I love you. Won't you accept my love? Won't you return it? This is life's fundamental choice. And this is why God has made us free. He invites us to share his companionship and to enter into a relationship of friendship with him. But he only invites us. He will not force us. He will not pressure us. He issues the invitation. But the rest is up to us. Freedom is above all else the wondrous power to accept God's love and to return it. By using our freedom in order to love, we fulfill our destiny and unite ourselves to God. St. John tells us, God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. The founding fathers of this republic saw the religious basis of human freedom. They knew that God is the source of man's freedom and that faith in God is freedom's most certain safeguard. Late in the 17th century, William Penn said, the man who is not governed by God will be ruled by a tyrant. On September 17, 1769, George Washington delivered his farewell address. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. On March 6, 1799, President John Adams issued a proclamation. It is also most reasonable in itself that men who are capable of social arts and relations, who owe their improvements to the social state and who derive their enjoyments from it, should as a society make acknowledgments of dependence and obligation to him who hath endowed them with these capacities and elevated them in the scale of existence. On May 30, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln echoed the same tradition. The Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations, has by a resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. It is the duty of nations to confess their sins and trespass in humble sorrow, yet with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. President Dwight Eisenhower, in 1955, spoke before the American Legion. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. We are indeed the heirs of a great tradition, a tradition of faith and a tradition of freedom. This great tradition is now under attack. The forces of tyranny march ahead. In many parts of the world, human rights are denied and men are enslaved. The beliefs of Jefferson, Washington, and Lincoln are threatened. Never before has the sacredness of the human personality and the freedom of man been so totally challenged. There is no reason for us to flee this challenge. But let us boldly face it. You can begin by formulating your own personal philosophy of freedom. Do you know what freedom means? Do you recognize the laws which govern its use? 
Are you fully aware of its purpose? Do you value freedom more than comfort, more than security, more than life itself? Can you say from your heart, give me liberty or give me death? Some sincere soul searching is in order. Think your life through in the presence of God. Form your own conscience and follow that conscience regardless of the cost involved. Do you shirk your responsibilities? Do you say, let somebody else do it? Remember, you are responsible for your own acts. You will be judged by them. Do you use your freedom to dissipate or to discipline yourself? Is the spiritual or the sensate dominant in your life? Remember, there is an alternative to state control. That's self-control. We as a people have tremendous technological know-how. Let us use it to subdue the earth and put it at the service of man. Let us spread the blessings of this know-how to the far corners of the earth. And let each of us begin by spiritualizing our own surroundings. The material world is to be used to ennoble rather than to degrade the dignity of man. And remember why God has made you free. He wants you to love. Use your freedom in order to love your fellow man. Treat all men with respect to a creature made in the image of God. Use your freedom to surrender your life to the love of God. For it is in his friendship that your freedom finds its fulfillment. Yes, let each of us rededicate himself to the Christian democratic ideals which underlie our American tradition of freedom. Let us close our ranks and steel ourselves for the battle of head. In defense of freedom, let us join Jefferson and Franklin and Washington in pledging our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honors. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their nation as witnesses to the religious truth which underlies American freedom.